The scripture reading is from Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 24. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders, and signs that God did through him among you, as you yourselves know. This man, handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up, having freed him from death, because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. The word of the Lord. Pretty amazing story if you think of it as a part two from last week. Remember, uh, everyone was gathered in Jerusalem before Jesus had uh, sent the gift of the Holy Spirit. So they were waiting and wondering and not really sure how all this was going to go down. And then a huge interruption to their gathering comes when the Holy Spirit whooshes in like a mighty wind, divided tongues as a fire on everybody's head, and they start speaking in different languages, you remember? And all the visitors from out of town that come to Grover Beach to be on the dunes, they just all heard, uh, the Bakersfieldians heard in their own language, and the Fresnoans heard in their own language. No, it's incredible, isn't it? Everyone from out of Dodge was hearing the gospel proclaimed in a way that they understood. And so last week, we talked about the importance of translating our experience of God in a way that people can really grasp. So we're not speaking in Christianese, or we're not talking in a way that nobody is listening, in a way that perhaps nobody even understands. But the accusation was leveled against the church. The first sermon that the church preaches in all of these other languages, and the peanut gallery commentary, the hecklers from the back row decide they've had too much new wine. And like any good comedian, you know, Peter knows how to deal with hecklers, right? You've gotta, you can't just let them go. You can't give them, a, give them an audience. You've got to really knock them down. So Peter gives this great one-liner. These are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only 9 o'clock in the morning, people. Get your heads on great. Well, here's the thing. If you put yourself out there and share what God is doing in your life, the opportunity to be misunderstood is plentiful, wouldn't you say? They are all over the place. If you, if you put yourself front and center where people can see you as an example of what God is taking that is broken and starting to fix, what God is healing up, what God is strengthening, we're not saying we're going to put ourselves out there as perfect examples. Look at me, I've arrived, thank you very much. No, that's not what you're doing, but you put yourself out there even as a broken work of grace, what is going to happen? Some people aren't going to get it. And in fact, they could turn nasty about it. Anyone had an experience like that? You don't have to raise your hand because anyone who's done it has an experience like that. It's just too easy to look at something and misunderstand, to not really walk a mile in someone's moccasins enough to know what's going on in your heart. So what do they do? They dig into your past. They say, oh yeah, you're a Christian now, okay, whatever. Or they pull up whatever it is. And I would just expect that because it really is just par for the course in just about every way. As you start to follow Jesus, particularly in this Pentecost kind of a way that the whole early church is experiencing where there's supernatural stuff happening, people are not going to get it. They're going to sneer. They're going to accuse. They're going to even persecute. And we don't really say that too loud in the new members class, but you know, Jesus was pretty clear if you follow me, you're going to be persecuted. That's just part of the deal. You know, we don't put that on the church sign very often, right? 
come join our church, your life will be miserable. <laughs> That's just not the case. But you remember what happens to every single one of the apostles, right? Except John, we think, dies of a ripe old age, perhaps uh, exiled on an island in the middle of the ocean, right? They all get killed for their faith. You may remember what happened to Jesus when the most loving person in the universe shows up. What is the response uh, to that love, to healing the sick? And my favorite lines in this, there's one in the God, John's Gospel we saw over the Easter season, and it said something to the effect of, Jesus healed this person, and the next line is, and the religious leaders wanted to figure out how to kill him. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine being so misunderstood that you actually bring a miracle of healing into somebody's life? And somebody watching from the outside says, yeah, snipers, take the shot. I mean, it just, it just doesn't seem like the right response. And yet it has happened so often to so many over so many centuries that we just have to say, get ready, because that is just the way it's going to be. Doesn't stop Peter, though, does it? He goes into this incredible message about Jesus. He doesn't make it all about Peter. He doesn't make it all about the church. He just says, here's what you did. You brought Jesus, and Jesus came to town, and you decided to kill him. But hey, guess what? God raised him from the dead, and now his spirit has been poured out, and he goes into this long thing about David and how David is really speaking like Jesus and how Jesus descends into hell and rescues everybody. And it's this powerful sermon in a lot of the rest of Acts chapter 2. But we get just a piece of it this morning because it captures, I think, what Peter is getting at. In many ways, Peter is just kind of getting out of the way and letting the gospel speak. But the gospel doesn't speak on its own very often, right? It's not like we just hear loudspeakers from heaven proclaiming every time the gospel speaks through a person, through you, when you proclaim what God has been up to in your life. And all of a sudden, you get misunderstood. But Peter is not deterred. He simply points to this simple presentation, kind of a simple experience. I don't know, a lot of people get a little bit worried about sharing their faith with other people because they don't have the Bible memorized like the rest of the people in the room. You're the only one that doesn't have the Bible memorized. It's really sad. We pray for you all the time not having the Bible memorized, but, you know, what are you going to do? Every church has one, I guess. That's... Now, none of us have the Bible memorized, right? None of us have everything figured out. None of us have all the answers, but what do we have? We have a simple message. I once was lost, I now am found, or I'm pretty lost still, but I'm getting founder as time goes on, or however it is you want to proclaim that truth, that's what comes forth out of messy old you and me. That's just the way that it works. And Peter's no exception. He gets up, he wants to make sure people knew. He doesn't sugarcoat it. He says, this is Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified. That's the message. Because who's standing there in the crowd? Literally, the people that accuse Jesus so that he gets killed. So Peter's not kind of pulling punches. He's telling it like it is. But he also gets to the good part about how God raised him from the dead. And he makes sure people know about this prophecy from Joel. Did you hear when Naomi was reading that? Such a great promise for those of us down the ages. After he mentions they're not drunk. <laughs> I love that. No, he says, this is what is spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Now the question is, when does this happen? When are the last days? Some people make a lot of money thinking the last days are only today. They weren't yesterday, but they are today. Or they'll be someday. But if you read all the New Testament writers, they all use the last days interchangeably for what? Today. As soon as Jesus is on the scene, as soon as Jesus has broken the bonds of death, according to the Bible, we are living in the last days. So these last days have been a long time, 2,000 almost years, right? We're talking about last days. But this is Joel talking way before Jesus. Now Peter is quoting him as, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Now is this what happened on the day of Pentecost? It sure sounds like it, right? But so often with these Old Testament scriptures, they have a now component, but they also have kind of a, a not yet kind of part to them. They have kind of a, here's what's going on, but here, well, just see how it reads. You see, uh, uh, in the last days, 
it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Check. We see that happen for sure um, in the upper room in Acts chapter 2. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy. I don't know, were there any sons and daughters in the room? Maybe. That could have been uh, there. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Even on slaves, both men and women in those days. The church is made up of all these people, right? There's men. There's women. There's rich folk. There's poor folk, right? There's all kinds of people. There's people uh, of, 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 of a, a, a more mature stature, perhaps, grandparents, parents, kids. I mean, we're talking about multi-generational, multi-economic. We're talking about all flesh. There's not a person that is left out of this. In fact, when you got all these visitors from out of town, there's even kind of an international component, a cross-cultural experience. It seems like God's desire when he's pouring out his spirit is not limited to the people that think they know it all. <laughs> it seems to me it really is all people across all society, across all swaths, whatever, whatever way you want to cut it demographically, it seems like that's what God is talking about. But he keeps going in verse, uh, uh, what is that, uh, 19, I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness the moon to blood. Doesn't it sound like a horror movie or something? I mean, it just sounds like a pretty big deal. And you say, did that happen on that day? Well, I don't know if they saw any of these kind of miraculous things. Some people have interpreted to mean, you know, kind of big change in the Roman government. Stars represent people and what have you. It's a little bit unknown about how to do that. But there certainly seems to be a not yet component uh, to some of this. But certainly a lot of it is happening right before their eyes. The Holy Spirit has shown up in such a way that nobody can say, oh, was that just my emotions really floating that day? Or, I mean, it seems like the Holy Spirit came and said, nobody walked out of that experience going, I wonder if there's a God. They just knew, right? Because when the supernatural happens, that's the point. So that it turns people's uh, hearts, minds, bodies, every orientation they have to God. That's the beauty of miracles. That's the beauty of healing or prophetic words or anything that would happen, the speaking in other languages. All of that stuff is not an end to itself, but it has a purpose. And the purpose comes right at the end of this reading where Peter quotes again from Joel, then everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. When we think about the purpose of the Holy Spirit in our lives, the purpose of the Holy Spirit across his church, we recognize it's not some of the things we might think that he's for. At the end of the day, the Holy Spirit wants everyone to point to Jesus and everybody that points to Jesus, Jesus says, I came here to glorify my Father. There's this kind of virtuous circle in the Trinity where everybody's not taking credit, but just saying, Hey, look what we have accomplished. Pay attention and it will absolutely change your life. Because when you see the way the Trinity operates, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, when you see what they're up to in the universe and specifically what they're up to with Jesus, all of a sudden, life on earth starts to make sense again in a way that it didn't beforehand. And so the Holy Spirit comes with all of his power And he brings all of his toolbox along with him. So who has the Holy Spirit might be a good question uh, to ask. I mean, I did. I love it. I love it. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't, uh, they didn't have an experience. Did anyone speak in tongues when they walked in today? You probably don't want to raise your hand to that one. If you did, that's right. Uh, uh, Lutherans have pitchforks hidden under the pews just in case a moment like that uh, occurred. Actually, we believe in speaking in tongues, don't we? Because it happened in the Bible. So if it's in the Bible, it must be true, right? It's got to be. But Paul spends a lot of time clarifying on that. A lot of churches get divided over it, so it's probably not worth spending too much time here. But just the supernatural stuff in general, most of us don't see that as often as we saw it in the book of Acts. It seems like any time the apostles go somewhere, they heal someone. Anytime they proclaim the gospel, uh, people fall down on the ground and start speaking in tongues. That just seems like normal business for the early church. But it doesn't seem like normal business for the Lutheran church. Do you think that's right? I would just say that's true. And you have to wonder, am I lowering my experience 
Or rather, am I lowering the Bible to meet with my experience of faith? Or am I going to raise my faith to the truth that's in God's Word? And probably somewhere in the middle of all this, we'll meet and we'll figure this stuff out together. If you've ever prayed for someone and seen something amazing happen, well, then you know the Holy Spirit is still alive and well doing his thing. If you've ever been praying and all of a sudden you get this kind of divine nudging or guidance or input and you say, oh, you know what, i got to do something about that, and you act on it, you know the Holy Spirit is still doing his thing. And while we may not see him whooshing through the room in quite the same way, that doesn't happen very often, though it has been reported in various churches over the centuries where you do see even that particular manifestation happen. I don't think it's ever happened in my experience. I might have had too much new wine and just missed it. I'm not sure. But, but when you think about that, I mean, it is a, it's a strange thing, a thing that people are going to misunderstand, a, people, a thing that people are not going to get right away. It causes a lot of confusion. But at the end of the day, at the end of Peter's sermon, we'll hear next week that thousands of people come to trust Jesus. Can you imagine? Thousands of people. I mean, this is back in a day and age where we didn't have billions of people on the planet, right? So you multiply that by inflation. What are we talking about? Stadiums full of, I mean, this is a lot of people that hear this word. And what happened? There was a supernatural experience. The people of God step up to the plate, share what it means to them. And people immediately ask, how can we be saved? What do we have to do? What's the next step for us? Again, a fairly foreign concept in the church today. I mean, I probably could count on my hand the number of times someone has come up to me and said, Greg, what do I have to do to get right with God? I mean, just all of a sudden, it just doesn't happen as often. Now, do people get right with God? Do people hear the gospel and experience transformation? Of course, that happens all the time because we need it to happen, right? We spend time listening to the word, hearing sermons, singing songs, gathering in worship, meeting in Bible studies, all of the point is so that God can transform us, fill us with the Spirit, and of course, send us out in this powerful way. But so often when we read about supernatural stuff in the Bible, it can't help but bring up a sense of disappointment at our own experience. The miracle stories of healing are almost always that way. You read about how Jesus heals people, and then you realize someone you love has cancer, and you go, well, what's Where's that disconnect? What, what, what's missing in this equation? So often when we do funerals, we'll read the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. Well, talk about the ultimate disconnect. We just proclaimed how Jesus raises people from the dead, and now we're putting this body in the ground? That doesn't seem right. Why don't we just raise this person up from the dead? I mean, do you see the disconnect? Do you see how that could lead to some misunderstanding, some disappointment? Or when people talk about even something as simple as, oh, I really felt God was speaking to me today, and I felt like this is what he was saying, or I kind of felt like he was guiding me to do this. And then you sit there and you go, well, I don't, I don't feel like God's guiding me. Why, why does she get words like that and I get, you know, the television or whatever? <laughs> well, maybe that's the problem. I'm not sure. But you see what I mean? It immediately draws up the disconnect. It, it, it draws up kind of a cavern. A chasm between our experience and the Bible's experience. Or even something as simple as Joel's prophecy, when he, when he lifts up all these different ways that the Spirit is going to be poured out on your sons and daughters. They shall prophesy, Joel says. Peter quotes it. He's talking to the crowd. He's saying, your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Do you have any sons and daughters, any of you? I do. Are they prophesying? I certainly want them to. That's my prayer every day, that they would be raised in the faith, that they would be filled with the Spirit, and every day of their lives they would do what? Turn to where God is leading and follow that. But for many of us, that's not the experience that we have. That's the disconnect. We think of sons and daughters that are, you know, out in left field doing God knows what, and we think, why, why, why? Do you ever have that kind of sense at times? But Peter doesn't say this is just going to be an easy walk. In fact, he outlines some pretty difficult things later in the sermon. But he goes on with Joel's prophecy. He says, your young men shall see visions. Do we have any young men in the church? There we go. Well done, David. That's good, yeah. (laughs) 
St. John's has redefined what young and old mean to me. In our last church, people that were in their 60s seemed really old and decrepit. I hope they don't watch or listen on the internet. But that's, but that's just the way it seemed. It seemed like, wow, 60, that's pretty ancient. I hope you're okay. Can we get you uh, some tea and put you in a special chair? And I came to St. John's, and 80-year-olds are up on ladders changing light bulbs and doing things I couldn't do in my, in, in my 20 years ago. It just, it's, it's redefined everything. Young and old, it just seems like, uh, I don't know, there's something in the water in this area where people just seem healthier. Is that right? Do you have a solution? Oh, you're going to be the young man today? Well done. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but there is, I don't know, at St. John's, people seem, when you find out how old they are, you kind of go, really? <laughs> I mean, you do it politely. You don't, you, you don't, you don't say anything. You know, you don't look a day over 90. That's amazing. That uh, It's not that people don't die. They just seem to live on in a whole other way here a, a long time. It's, it's amazing. So that's one of the reasons I was excited to move here because I thought, well, I'm going to be skinny like all of these older folks around our church. That, that's going to happen for sure at some point. It's just going to, I just need to drink enough water around here and I'll be, I'll be fine. So the, yeah, I mean, anyway, I think I've gotten off on a tangent. Forgive me. But the, yeah. But one problem we see across the church today, not just at St. John's, but across the whole American church especially, is we don't see a lot of young guys. We see whole generations that are absent from pews on Sunday morning. You think, why is that? That seems like a disconnect. Why are people not healed? Why don't I hear prophetic words? Why don't I see the Spirit alive and well? Why are my kids not following me? Why are, why, where are the young guys? I mean, it just seems like over and over we just kind of come to this chasm and say, Lord, what is going to cross this for us, what's going to make uh, the difference? I'll give you one more. In those days, your old men shall dream dreams. Well, we have some old men. <laughs> Though I won't say what categorizes as old, you know. I think Denny's, didn't they lower their kind of uh, thing now? You can get uh, the senior discount if you're 35 now. Is that <laughs> is that? I, I've gotten literature from AARP, so I know that the age of old is changing in our culture. That's just the way that it is. But the old folk, it says, the Bible says, Joel says, are going to, did you catch that? Dream dreams. Young guys get visions, old guys dream dreams. Young and old, men, women, the whole nine, rich, poor, it's all there. And I, I don't know. I, 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 my experience of this is really crystallizing in a different way around St. John's because I do see a lot of older folk who are not just settling down to retire until they die. It feels like so many of you have been teaching me that there is a whole other level of life that comes when you don't have to work for the man and you can just spend your leisure time doing whatever. And whatever for many of you has become so valuable, so powerful, it can't help but have come from a vision. It can't help but have come from uh, somebody dreaming a dream. Why do people serve the way they serve around St. John's when they could just be out on the golf course? Well, some of you are out on the golf course. Nothing wrong with golf, but you see what I mean. You fit in other things besides golf. You fit in other things besides leisure. You fit in other things. You serve in such a powerful way. That doesn't just happen unless God is doing something causing you to dream new dreams. And to me, this is just utter testimony that this prophecy is not just for someday, it's for then and certainly for now. And it seems to me that God must be having some schemes, some dreams, some visions for all of this stuff to come to pass. The young will be in the family of faith. Sons and daughters will return to the experience of trusting God with their lives. Now, these are general promises. You know, we all have different experiences. But isn't that the prayer of so many of us? That not just sons and daughters somewhere, but our sons and daughters. Those are the ones that we cry for. Those are the ones that we want to see closer to God. And so we think, what on earth is going to break this cycle? What on earth is going to be able to cross this chasm? Well, we're going to see in the next couple of weeks specifically what God is up to, but I'll just give you a little spoiler alert. What I see happening then and I see happening today is more and more people following in the power of the Holy Spirit in a whole different way. 
They're people that live in the power of the Spirit in a way that some followers of Jesus just don't seem to. Now, does that mean they're so much more spiritual, they're better than everybody else? Well, it's not a better or worse kind of a thing. It's more of an awake or asleep kind of a thing. And when you run into Christians that have been Christians a long time, but they're effectively asleep, they're not the ones that Joel is talking about, are they? They're talking about, he's talking about, people that are so connected with God, so filled with the Spirit, that they don't do anything without checking with the Spirit. They want the Spirit to be involved in everything that they're up to. And all of a sudden, you start to see new uh, visions pop out of people. You start to see new ways of being family together. You start to see new uh, uh, relationships start forming. And all of a sudden, we start looking a lot more like the early church. This fall, we want to do some really important work uh, for the grandparents and the great-grandparents in the room uh, uh, called grandparenting at a distance because some of you have kids and grandkids that are far away and we're going to bring in some expert grandparents to help us learn how to do this well so we can not just be connected but we can be connected in the family of faith we want to spend some time in our prayer ministry lifting up the very real pain of sons and daughters that seem distant uh, from God and see if we can seek the Lord's guidance specifically for them, not just for in general. And there's a whole host of things that the Holy Spirit does when he's in the room, when it comes to bringing healing, when it comes to bringing guidance, when it becomes translating into other languages, whatever it might be, he is available to do all of that. But for many of us, we kind of think, yeah, but that would really change things a lot. <laughs> it might be a little bit strange. But if we want to continue to raise up our experience to the experience of the scriptures. We need to be open to whatever he might do in our midst. And so there's some caveats, there's some bewares, there's some uh, uh, banks in the river that we need to establish as we do that well. And we'll look at some of those in the next couple of weeks if you want to bear that out with us, come back and check it out. But now I'd really love us to move into a time of worship because there's a lot that the head can process but it feels to me as we sing, as we, as we express ourselves with our whole bodies, that God does something else in our midst. And so what we're going to do, Kevin's going to lead us today. Kevin Colton, who's married to Julia Colton, uh, who is the daughter of Clive Baker. Does some of you know Clive, who was here for 100 years? Would you say he was old? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. But some of you, uh, he died recently. But, uh, but, uh, but uh, Kevin's going to be leading us as we sing. So why don't we stand and let's just come to God worshiping him for who he is.